Unfortunately, in our modern society, personal feelings reign supreme in matters rela relating to relationships, and this phenomena has surely had its effect upon us as well. As a result, God's standards for relationships are viewed as archaic and unworkable in our modern times. When God's instructions conflict with our feelings, we find ways to reinterpret what God has said so that we can follow our feelings and believe we're obeying God. Even in our Torah portions and in our Haftorah portion and in the apostolic portion, there were certain aspects of someone's life that was characterized by sin. And what was the outcome from it? They will have no part with God. And yet in our society, they're saying, oh, no, 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 no. You can't say that. The way he lives, the way she lives, what he does with his friends, what she does with her friends, doesn't matter. Everything's okay. How do we teach our children differently? We have to be careful. We have to guard their innocence as their young children. Why should they have to learn about everything that's going on in our society when they're that young? Wouldn't there be some place where they could be shielded from all of that? But inevitably they will face it. So, in this way, relationships based upon personal feelings have replaced objective biblical standards and feelings and have eclipsed the bedrock of obedience. Do you know that our text that we read in the Torah today is used by many to say that God approves of polygamy? If you read it the way it was read in the English, it sure looks that way. It reminds us that we need to dig deep and study carefully as we read the Bible. Well, uh, what should I do has been replaced by what does my heart tell me to do? Or if you want to say it honestly, what does my flesh tell me to do? Little wonder the ears of many have gone deaf to the Torah because the hearts of many no longer feel the need to listen to that unchangeable standard that regulates the lives of all people in all eras. I had this conversation numbers of times this past week because I, I donate my time to work with a, a Bible software program while I'm there to help people learn what it is and so forth and so on, accordance Bible software. But at the Society of Biblical Literature, there, it, it is in connection with the AAR, which is the American Academy of Religions. And so there's everything there. There's the Buddhists, there's the Muslims, there's everything at the Society of Biblical Literature because there's two parts of it that meet together. And so when they come into the, the place where I'm sitting and showing people, demonstrating things to people, they see me wearing a kippah. What do they think? Yeah. Jewish, of course, but they automatically think that I'm not a believer in Jesus. When I tell them, I, when they say, oh, you're, you're Jewish, I say, yeah, because I am. When I say, but I'm Messianic, do you know what that means? And they say, what? I say, I believe in Jesus. His Hebrew name is Yeshua. I believe he's the true Messiah. It gives me an opportunity to, to witness some. But there are those who say, what? Why would you do that? What's wrong? You know, what happened to you? There were Jewish non-believers in Yeshua that came and I talked with, and they're on that very, very liberal side of Judaism, and they say, oh, great. doesn't matter what you believe. Glad you were in Akiva. I'm thinking to myself, we don't want to be against everybody. We don't want to be, you know, ogres and just say, you have to do it my way or I don't want anything to do with you. No, that's not at all what we're saying. We want to reach out to these people because they're walking a path of death. They think that the way they're going is good, but the way they end, the end there is the way of death. Shouldn't we have compassion? But we cannot give up truth and have compassion. We have to be able to carry the truth carefully and give the truth carefully, but we must stay with the truth and we cannot diminish it. We can't water it down. In fact, I, in, the, in the New American Standard Bible that was read of the uh, Torah portion, 
If you have your Bibles, you can open it there to uh, Exodus 21. Verse 6, it said, well, in verse 5 it says, But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man. Verse 6, then his master shall bring him to God. Well, and then there's a note, if you have a New American Standard Bible, that says, it's, it says, or the judges who act in God's name, which is what this means, Elohim, here, because the other two times that Elohim is used in the same chapter, the NESB translates it as judges, which is correct. Why would judges be called gods in, in this? Or why would they be called God? It means that they have the power of life and death. God can give life and God can take life. Now, there's other times when a man can take a man's life. Did you notice in our Torah portion? If it's nighttime and someone breaks into your house and you take that person's life, you're, you're not guilty. But if it's daytime, then what? Then you have to be careful. You can't take his life. You have to warn him. You can't just shoot and ask questions later because you don't know who it is. When somebody breaks in at nighttime, that could be someone who's trying to take your life. So it's in self-defense. So you can see how that works. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Well, how does it change? The question, I'll repeat it, uh, that, that was back when they didn't have lights to turn on, but they did have oil lamps. And uh, But basically, it, it's, it's giving a general saying, if you're unable to identify the person and you believe, and I'm adding to it here, and you believe that you're in harm's way by way of saving your life, you have the right to shoot first or you have the right to hit first or whatever. Um, but if there's an ability for you to see, then you have to take other measures. You have to call out, stop, don't come any further, so forth and so on. I don't know who you are, say who you are, so forth and so on. But you have time to do that because you can see where the person is and whether they're armed and that kind of a thing. But my point is this. When the text says you shall bring them to God, and it means judges clearly in the context, it means that God has appointed judges to act on his behalf. That means when we go contrary to the judges, we're going contrary to God. Now you might say, well, what about in a society where the judges are corrupt? Well, that's a good question. Hasn't that been the case in every society, including Israel's society? <laughs> sure. But it means that God expects people to be ordered, not to be self-governed every person because that doesn't work. It's not natural for us to submit to authority, is it? We have to put down the flesh to submit to authority. Especially, well, almost always when the authority tells us to do something we don't want to do. You know, when the authority says, I'm here to let you know that the city's given you $10,000 to help build your, or repair your house, you can say, oh, okay, great, thank you. Then you have to ask, are there any strings attached? Because that might be, but nonetheless, you understand what I'm saying. When they come and say, you know, you have to, you have to move your sidewalk over four feet because you're on our property, you're thinking, oh, you're kidding me. Do I have to do this? You see what I'm saying? Submission to authority starts with submission to God. If we're submitting to God, then we're able and willing to submit to the authorities that it puts in place. At the bottom of page uh, two, we I talk more specifically. Our Pasha begins with the words, these are the ordinances. Ele ha-mishpatim. Uh, mishpat, translated ord ordinance, literally means judgment. In other words, these are God's assessments, his judgments in terms of how relationships within the Torah community are to be lived out. We are faced, therefore, with a clear and simple decision. Will we accept God's assessments regarding proper relationships, or will we set them aside for our own? Will we trust his way or lean upon our own understanding? The opening paragraph deals with a slave or servant was to be treated in terms of the economics of his or her service to the master. It may sound very foreign to us, uh, foreign to us that, the, the, that the slave belongs to the master. Please understand this. Most people in the ancient world, especially in the ancient Israelite culture, gave themselves to slavery because they had gotten themselves into debt that they couldn't get out of. 
many times that was the case. And because they were in debt and impoverished, they gave themselves to be a servant or a slave to another person in order to work off that debt. When the person that they were working for, instead of paying them, would pay the debt, then that's how it worked. However, you could have a debt that you could never get paid off in a lifetime. Okay? Depending upon what the wages were. So that's why you have the text saying, if you, if you come in single, if a man comes in single, but then the, uh, he, he finds a, a woman to marry and she's willing to marry him, but that woman is also indentured to the owner, then when he leaves, he has to pay her he has to pay her, uh, her, her redemption to come out of slavery or she remains there. But then, isn't it interesting? It says, but if he says, no, I love my master, then you remember the all on the door? But he brings them before the judges again. Why? To make sure that everybody's got the same bookkeeping. Yes, so that's what I talk about there on page 3. The English reads, he shall go out alone. However, the issue being dealt with here is one of economics, as the wider context makes clear, because it's damages and restitution. Often in the ancient world, a person became a slave or servant in order to repay a debt for which he or she did not have the ability to pay. In Israel, however, six years was the maximum for such an arrangement. The sabbatical year marked the release of all slaves. Yes, Hebrew slave. No. Okay, the question is, isn't it just about a Hebrew slave? But if you came and attached yourself to the Lord, you were given the same status as a Hebrew. It says in numbers of places, the law shall be the same for the native-born and for the sojourner. When the text says he shall go out alone, oh, the Hebrew uh, uh, translated alone, begapo, which is the preposition bet followed by gof, the third masculine and singular possessive suffix, uh, he. The question is the meaning of gof. What does this word mean? Most commentators take it, take this word to be from goof, which means body, and thus meaning in or with his own body, that he, that is, he is free to go as he came. But again, in the context, the issue is monetary. Since a slave did not earn wages, when the time of release came, he legally could only take with him what he had initially brought. So we should understand the phrase, he shall go out alone, to mean he does not have to pay a redemption price for himself. This meaning is confirmed by the parallel of the next verse, 21.5, in which the word chafshi uh, means free. I will, go, I will not go out free. That, that means when the year of release comes, you don't have to pay anything. You, you're released. This is why it became, and it was it's talked about in the prophets, that people would not take somebody a year before the, you know, I only get a year's uh, help or work from him, and then he goes away free. And they said, no, no, don't do, don't do that. Why do you think God put that law in here? Why six years and the seventh you go free? Well, if you know anything about the history of our nation, you might understand why. Because slaves that were slaves generation after generation, families after families, had no ability to make it on their own. God did not want Israel to be a nation of slaves. It seems obvious that if uh, the slave had the means, he could pay the redemption price for his wife, money which he acquired during the time of servitude, and children. Such a scenario is not entirely out of the question. Other family members or friends could have come to his aid in supplying the necessary redemption price for his newly acquired family. But even if he did not have the means to redeem his wife and children, he had the option to re remain with them as an indentured slave. It appears as though the owner was not given the option of refusing such a re request. He would take the man to God, literally to the place where God's judgment was made, that is, the recognized court. This is another place where Elohim is used of judges, as in 22, 8, and 9 in order to establish that the slave or servant who had the legal right to go free had given up this right in order to remain with his wife and children. Wow, that would be love, wouldn't it? That would be genuine dedication. Now, 
A major question now arises in such a scenario. Is the man to be counted as a purchased slave or as a free man? Has he given up his freedom so that he remains in the status of a slave, or is his master obligated to compensate him for work? You know, slavery is not such a big issue with us today, but it would have been years and years and generations ago in America, right? And there still is the question, is slavery right? I'm convinced that the scriptures say slavery is right only when that person that has indentured themselves or become a slave or a servant to you. Remember, it's the same word for slave or servant, doesn't it? It's the same Hebrew word, it's the same Greek word, doulos. Um, they're paying off a debt. That's an entirely different thing than saying if your skin is a different color that you, you have to be a slave. No. The scriptures don't know anything about that. This is talking about paying off a debt. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. Well, the question is, if this slave puts his ear to the doorpost, does he go free at the Shemitah? What does Shemitah mean? The Shemitah year is the seventh year, right? What does Shemitah mean? No, no, it doesn't mean jubilee, that's Yovel. Release, right, it means release. Release of debt, release of, 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 of ownership. A crux in answering this question is the word olam um, in 21.6. He shall serve him permanently, olam. If this means for the rest of his life, then how are the laws of the Shemitah and Yovel, the sabbatical and jubilee years, to be observed? For our text begins by noting that the slave in question is a Hebrew, and Leviticus 25, 40 through 41 makes it clear that all Hebrew slaves were to return to their families of the Jubilee. This being the case, the rabbis understood our text to mean that the slave who put his ear to the doorpost remains a slave to his master and, uh, only until the Jubilee. At that time, he and his family go free. Thus, the slave who remains with his master in order to remain with his uh, family is working for the release of his wife and children. His labor is compensated by purchasing the redemption of his family at the Jubilee. So that seems to be because it is the same, uh, the olam, or uh, you know, it seems to be cognate to our word for jubilee. This gets very technical, but, and I don't want to spend all of our time on technical things, but now I'm going to get even more technical. <laughs> Go over to page five. Is that where, I, oh, no, bottom of page four. But 2110 seems to talk of polygamy. It appears to describe the scenario in which the man who initially obtained the young woman as a, lo as a slave took her as his wife and then later is displeased with her. As a result, he marries another woman. Then 2110 indicates that in regard to the slave woman whom he initially married, he must maintain her food, her clothing, and her conjugal rights. So on a service reading, it appears that the man is required by the Torah to maintain both women as wives. That would be a command in the scriptures for polygamy. Why, just at the outset, why would we say polygamy cannot be how we should interpret this text, even though it appears as that's the case? It's because marriage was given to us to, re to tell us about the relationship between God and his people. God does not have two wives. He has one. Um, the dispensationalists have a problem with that sometimes, but nonetheless, uh, the church is not one wife and Israel another wife. And does he not refer to himself as the wife of Israel? Right in, in the uh, New Covenant uh, text of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, he says, I'm going to, pardon me? Yeah, husband, excuse me. Um, but a husband of one wife is what I meant to say. Okay, so um, what does Jeremiah say in the New Covenant text? It will come about after those days that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made when they came out of Egypt, which they broke, even though I was a husband to her. The whole issue of marriage was to be a, a very clear picture of God's careful, singular relationship with his chosen people. And you say, well, what about those who are not Israelites? Well, Paul teaches us the answer to that, doesn't he? Everyone who comes to join himself to the Lord is grafted into this people. All believers are sons of Abraham. And 
Paul even says that, right? It's like, why does he make a big point of that? I remember years ago asking somebody, why does Paul make such a big point of, of believers being sons and daughters of Abraham? Who cares if you're sons or daughters of Abraham? What's the big point? It's because you and I have become members of one singular covenant, a covenant that God initially made with Abraham, which ultimately were renewed in the new covenant. And how do we know that it was that covenant? Because Paul tells us in Galatians 3, the gospel was preached to Abraham when it was said, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. One people with one God, one husband and one wife. That's why when we start seeing things in the scriptures that seem to point towards polygamy, we say, we better re-examine this. Okay, I'm going to give you a very quick, don't fall asleep, please, okay? This is what the codex, this is what the actual manuscript looks like that most of your Bibles are translated from in terms of the uh, Tanakh, okay? This is Lenagradensis, okay? We do have Aleppo, but Aleppo is missing a bunch of stuff at the beginning, so it doesn't have Exodus in it, doesn't have Genesis in it. This is this was this manuscript uh, 1008 it's dated to so it's quite late okay but we don't have very much we have some earlier um, than that quite a bit earlier but this is the only one that we have that's complete now it is Masoretic yes it is it is the uh, okay the Masoretes were scribes and they were the ones that produced these um, these manuscripts from about the 5th century on, okay, into the 5th century of the Common Era. Now, that's where, that's where our Torah portion began. And this is the portion that we're going to talk about right now. So I, I blew it up a little bit. Now, the, I'll do my best to explain this very easily and quickly, okay? Um, there were times when the scribes said, the, the scribes, the Masoretic scribes were required to copy what was given to them in the manuscript that they were copying and making a copy of. But they had traditions at times that there were differences. Now, how did those differences come in? Some of them were simple mistakes that scribes previously made. They skipped a letter, they skipped a line, that kind of a thing. But a few of them, and as far as we can tell, very few, were done for, shall we say, theological reasons or religious reasons. By the time you come to the Masoretic era, you already have the, the division of the church and the synagogue, okay? Fifth century, sixth century. You already have the rise of the, of the rabbis who were controlling the synagogue, essentially. Now, who was the hero in the Christian church as far as the Jews would when the when the when the non-believing Jewish synagogue would look at the church, who would they say was their hero? Yeah, who's who is the hero for the church? Jesus, Yeshua. Who's the hero for the synagogue? Moses or who else? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Did uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have more than one wife? So if your heroes have more than one wife and you come to a portion in the Torah that says, it seems to say that's fine. Well, or if it says it isn't fine, do you think there might be a reason to change a few things? In verse uh, in, in verse, uh, in chapter 21, verse 8. Is this verse 8? I have to look and see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In your Bibles, it's, it says, if a, and I don't, now I'm paraphrasing, if a man acquires or buys a female slave and designates her to be his wife, and then he finds something in her that is unpleasing, then he cannot diminish her food, her clothing, or, as your Bible say, conjugal rights. That sounds like you have to continue to treat her as a wife and so forth and so on, right? But that's not what the Hebrew says. The word that I've circled right here is the word not. 
If a man, and well, I've got a few slides here that will have the English on it. If a man acquires a female slave and does not designate her for his wife, he can designate her for his son. But if her son, his son does not want her as wife, then you cannot diminish her food, her clothing, and the word conjugal rights is wrong. What does it mean? I've got it there. If you look at the bottom, well, okay, let me go through this and then we'll read. Okay? So what happens is in the margins of the um, manuscripts, they put what you should read. They couldn't change what was in the text. What's in the text is called the kativ, that means written. What's in the margin is called the kare, that's what's to be read. When you read this in the synagogue and you see a little dot over the letter or over the word, look over in the margin and read what's in the margin, not what's in the text. So there, the word not is pronounced low. And how is the word belonging to him pronounced? Low. It's just one letter difference. You have Lamed Aleph, that means no. You have Lamed Cholam Vav, that means belonging to him. So all they had to do was change one letter, and it still had the same pronunciation. Here's what the printed text looks like now that we read, and there's where our text uh, begins. Or that, this is verse 8, excuse me. And now I've blown it up a little bit for you, for those of you who can read some Hebrew. And it has the word lo, meaning no. And then over here, it has what you're supposed to read. Now I'm going to blow that up a little further. Okay? So here's where it has the word lo in the text. And here, there is this little circle over it, which is called a circula. That means go look, in the, go look in the margin, there's a different reading. So we come over here, and there's a kof, which means kare, which is short for what? Kara, kare, read. Not kativ, but kare. Read belonging to him. Don't read the word not. Every manuscript that we have available of this text, and it's not in Qumran, unfortunately, but I can imagine it would be that every manuscript we have is the same as this. It has not in the text itself. When, so if a man takes a woman and does not designate, uh, no, well, first of all, it says man takes a, sl a female slave and finds some, uh, some, something wrong, something unpleasing to him, and does not designate her as his wife, then he may, uh, then he may give, uh, designate her for, uh, for a wife to his son, if, if understood, if the son wants. But if not, he cannot reduce her food, her clothing, and then this word that uh, Buzz brought up, it's a lot, it, it only used here, and it's been shown conclusively, I believe, by top-notch scholars that it means oil. You think, what? Food, clothing, and oil? Um, Septuagint, I wrote a paper on it, we can talk about that later, but um, the, the, it, it, it means oil. Now, we found this out when we had the grand privilege of adopting our daughters. They were from Africa, right? They were used to high humidity. In fact, if you've ever been in West Africa, I carried a towel around with me. A handkerchief just didn't work because during the time when it's hot, it's so humid. In fact, there was fog on the ground up to your knees at times, and it was in the uh, high 80s, or early 90s. It's, it's so humid. Well, they, they love that. They came to our region, and we noticed that their skin started to become dry. And we said, oh, you've got to, you've got to oil up every day. You know, here's the oil. Which, this is what this word means. The very, some have translated it as cosmetics. Food, clothing, and cosmetics. It doesn't mean conjugal rights. There's no indication to that at all. 
There is a word in, I, I, I don't remember, in a cognate language that is similar to that means conjugal rights. Yes. Hello. Is this if he bought the slave specifically to be his wife and then changed his mind? Yes. Or is this every woman's slave? No. Okay. He would have... He would have to. He would have to say that I. I desire to have this woman as my wife, and I'm willing to redeem her, to be my servant. And then, then she's there, and he sees, says, "Nah, this isn't going to work. What? What do we do?" And because it goes on to say, because he has humbled her. Yes. Yes. So now that we've done this gymnastics, if scholars have determined this. And throughout the different text, it says this. Then how come, globally, we get to text like the NASB, and it doesn't change it? If so many people know, then why don't they say? Okay, part of the reason is is because there is controversy on this amongst the scholars, but particularly amongst the Jewish scholars. Okay, so I have okay. I've, I've given you a sample. Okay, here's the complete Jewish Bible. If her master married her, it doesn't say married her. It says designated her. If her master married her but decides she no longer pleases him, then he's not to allow he then he is to allow her to be redeemed. He is not allowed to sell her to a foreign people because he has treated her unfairly. Okay? How about the Jewish Publication Society? If she proved to be displeasing to her master who designated her for himself, at least they have designated. He must let her be redeemed. He shall not have the right to sell her to outsiders since he broke faith with her because he already promised that he would marry her. Here is the Tree of Life version. If she does not please her master who has selected her for himself, then he, same, same thing, okay? Here's the whole, what used to be called the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Now it's just called the Christian Standard Bible. If she does not please her master who chose her for himself, you see the word himself, 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 himself? That's the word that got changed from no, from not. Did not designate her. How about the KJV? If she pleases not her master who hath betrothed her to himself. How about the New King James Version? I thought maybe the New King James Version would have it, at least have a note. If she does not please her master who has betrothed her to himself. Same thing wrong. Net Bible. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, and there's no note. Why? The net has great notes. Why didn't it put a note on this one? How about the RSV? No, no, no. you got to wait. got to wait. Don't say nothing about the ASV. I've got it up here. Okay. <laughs> if she does not please her master, who has designated her for himself, RSV. Same thing. How about the new Revised Standard Version? If she does not please her master who designated her for himself. You would think that the Revised would come up with at least a note. How about the, uh, oh, I did the RSV twice, sorry. How about the ASV? If she pleases not her master, who hath espoused her to himself. But notice the ASV puts a note. And the note number four says, another reading is, so that he hath not espoused her. Which is correct. That's what it should be. The ASV got it right. Which was a, which was a, a, a redo of the RSV, right? I mean, it was, you know, it was updating it. How about the NIV? If she does not please the master who has selected her for himself, but then there's a note. Um, yeah, there's a note A, which is or not pleasing for her, not pleasing for her master, so that he does not choose her. So the NIV puts a note in on this one. NASB puts a note in. Another reading is so that he did not designate her. And the ESV also puts a note in. Or so that he has not designated her. 
So here's the whole reason why it took so much time to show you this. The word not is in the text. The word belonging to him, or designate for himself, is in the margin. You would think that the translators would put what's in the text and then put a note saying what's in the margin. But they don't. I don't know why. I read a paper on this several years ago at the Society of Biblical Literature and there were a lot of people who were there listening and I asked, could anybody tell me why they chose to do it this way, not the other? And the answers that I continued to get was that the Bible translators um, want to follow what was happening before. The King James Version didn't have all this, didn't have this manuscript. It was found later. So you could understand why the King James Version would go with what they had. But you would expect the New King James Version would have corrected it. So what's my point? That you all need to learn how to read the Hebrew and only read your Hebrew Bible? No, I know that's not, that's not going to happen. But having as one's primary Bible one of the translations that does not indicate important variant readings leaves a person in the dark as to what the biblical text may actually be saying. Please understand, can you trust your Bible? Yes. But let me give you some, I think, good advice, and it is this. Don't be afraid to check your translation against other translations and see where it differs. By the time you have the canon, canon is, is pretty much settled by the 4th century. Well, the, Masoretic, the Masoretes come after that. They're 5th century. Um, yeah, I, I think, I understand what you're saying, Dennis, and I, I agree with you. I, I think that the impetus was the struggle between the emerging Christian church and the separated synagogue. And the synagogue had to make sure that their heroes were not put down Unfortunately, the church was putting them down to a certain extent. They didn't measure up. And so I don't think it happened hardly at all. I would say less than 1%, maybe 2% at the most, where there are changes in the text that are theologically driven, but I think this is one of them. Because if you say that polygamy is contrary to God, then what do you say for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? We've all had this question. I mean, I remember... In seminary, people asking questions, well, how come God didn't punish Abraham when he, you know, when he took Hagar, and how come God didn't punish Jacob, and so forth and so on? Um, by the way, Isaac is, is in monogamy, right? Yeah, Isaac is the, <laughs> the exception to that triad. Um, and he's the son of promise, which is interesting. So there's a whole another kind of linking there. So... The God has preserved his word, and he gave, you know, when, when they were asking Yeshua about divorce, what did he, where did he go? He went back to Genesis 1 and 2. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall be one. So a man and a woman are one, not a man and women, or a woman and men. This is from the very beginning the revelation that God gave us of his covenant relationship with us. This is why the enemy wants to tear apart marriages. This is why the enemy wants to make it in our society where marriage is done away with. You don't need it. Just live together. There's no covenant. No commitment. Our marriages should reflect the love of God for his people and the faithfulness of God for his people. So, having as one's primary Bible one of the translations that does not indicate important variant readings leaves a person in the dark as to what the bi biblical text may actually be saying. Now, be, I, I want to be very careful here. I don't mean that you can't know the Word of God. Of course you can. But it would be helpful in the mass, vast minority of times, because the majority of the times, everything's going to be fine if you have a, a good translation. In the minority of times where there's a question, that's where you want to have another text to consult. The ASV, the NESV, the ESV, and often the NIV, not always, give, uh, by way of a footnote, give uh, more information by way of a footnote 
when an important variant reading exists in the text. The ASV um, was, was done before some of the manuscripts were found, so I would recommend, as an, at least as a Bible to consult, whatever Bible is your normal Bible that you're reading, have a New American Standard Bible or a ESV, English Standard Version, have one available so that you can compare. When you read something and there's a note in, in the NASB or the ESV that says other reading is, then at least you say, oh, okay, well, that's, is that a possibility then? How come it's not in mine? <laughs> How come they didn't give me any notice? If the primary Bible used is not one of these three, it would be wise to have an NASB, ESV, or NIV available to compare the portion you are reading or studying. And I would recommend NASB, ESV, um, because unfortunately the NIV is not consistent in putting the notes in. They did on this text, but on numbers of other texts that I've checked, they didn't. They had no note. I don't. Can you even buy the old one? I think you can only buy the 95 now. And by the way, they're they're in the process of making another. They're making a 2020. <laughs> the newer New American Standard. Yes. Okay. Question or comment? What is more? Yeah, I agree with you too on that. But what is? Uh, what is also on this text, the liberals have used this text to say, see, the Bible is inconsistent. On this text it says it's okay, on this text it says no. So you can't trust the Bible. The liberals have basically said, you, you know, those, those of you that say the Bible is inspired, it's the Word of God, it's consistent, it doesn't contradict itself, look, here's a contradiction. And, you know, when someone hears that on a radio program or somebody reads it on the Internet and they, they just go, oh, wow, what do I do? Because they're not telling you the whole story. And then if, if you have a Bible that has, you go look in your Bible and say, wait a minute, there's a note here that says another reading is, say, oh, they didn't tell me that. But if you don't have a Bible that has that note in it and you open up your English Bible and you say, oh, he cannot re restrict her food or clothing or her conjugal rights, because he designated her for himself, that must mean they're married. And then you have people that are wondering, what in the world? And then they go ask their teacher, and the teacher doesn't know, because he didn't or she didn't, you know, study the, the Hebrew or the Greek or whatever. Now, I'm, I, I don't get me wrong, please, understand, I, I want to say this very clearly. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic to love God with all your heart and to walk in his righteous ways. And you don't need it to know what the Bible says. But what you do need to do is due diligence to say, if there's a question, I'm going to investigate. I want to see, I want a Bible that will at least tell me there's a question here. Well, let me just close with this, and I want to, again, be very firm on this. Abortion is not the unforgivable sin. I know in the past when we've talked about this, and even when I've been in other groups, there are women that have come up to me and said, um, you know, I had an abortion and I don't know if I can ever forgive myself and I don't know if God can forgive me. No, God can forgive you and he will forgive you. And you can forgive yourself. If God forgives you, then anyone should be able to forgive you, including yourself. I mean, look what Paul did before he became a believer. How many lives, how much blood did he have on his hands? And yet he realized that God's atonement in his son Yeshua is powerful to forgive all sin. Now, we may carry the scars of some of the sin for the rest of our lives. You know, I mean, people that have uh, hurt themselves, ruined their themselves with, you know, sinful practices, they may, they may limp the rest of their life, but it doesn't mean they're not forgiven. So I just want to, I want to make that very clear. But here is, <laughs> in fact, I talked with somebody, I don't remember who it was recently, um, just talking about the relevance of the, uh, of this, he would say, the relevance of the Old Testament. I said, oh, really? What, you know, because he was questioning the relevance of, do we really need it? You know, pretty much everything that we need is in the New Testament. I said, okay, what, do, you, do you agree what do you think about abortion? He says, oh, it's absolutely wrong and it's a sin. Where do you find that in the New Testament? 
he couldn't point me to any to any any scriptures. But one of the scriptures that we have here in our Torah portion makes it very clear. If two men are fighting, and a woman who has is with child steps in to try to help her husband or something to that effect, and she's kicked or knocked or whatever, and her her child comes out prematurely, then there is a penalty. Her husband has the right to charge a penalty to the man who kicked her. Right? Okay? Monetary. What happens if the child comes forth premature and dies? Life or life? Well, I think it is clear these laws generally are dealing with manslaughter and negligent homicide. The laws which immediately follow describe death by a bull, uh, which known to be dangerous is nonetheless not sufficiently restrained by its owner. This describes, and by the way, it's uh, the Constitution that we have in the United States of America and the jurisprudence goes back down to this very thing. If you if you know that you have, um, I don't know, a balcony on your second floor, and it, and you know that it won't hold anybody, and yet you tell somebody to go up and go and sit out there, and that person falls off, you're in trouble. That's why we have codes, even if we don't like them all. We have building codes. Yeah, dog bite, yeah, same thing. So, it describes a situation of negligent homicide in the same way men who fight in the presence of a pregnant woman have neglected to take into consideration the high value of the child she carries. As such, injury to her child falls within the context of negligence, and if the child is killed as a result, then there is a clear case of negligent homicide. What lessons do we learn from this passage? Rather than supporting abortion, as some would have us think, this text accredits to the baby in the womb the status of a living soul. But this text, rightly understood, also gives us a glimpse into the heart of God and his view of life. Indeed, he sanctifies life. He sets it apart as valuable in all respects. It must therefore be cared for, nurtured, and protected. Not only must the life of a child within the womb of his or her mother be guarded, but the mother also must be cared for with special attention, for she is the very instrument of God to bring into his creation yet another soul, a soul created in his image, and bringing the breath of life from his very nostrils. Abortion, then, is nothing less than spitting in the face of God. It is a hideous his, uh, idolatry where mankind has put his own selfish interests and pleasures ahead of the clear commands of God. Living by feelings and not by Torah has opened the way for even religious people to find an excuse for snuffing out the life of the unborn. The scourge of partial birth abortions should horrify us all. And by the way, here on the left coast, we are leading the leading in, the, in that, unfortunately. The scourge of partial birth abortions, you all know what that is, right? I don't have to describe that with little ears around. Should horrify us all and launch us into action against it in every legal and God-honoring way. If the life of the unborn is of no value, then surely our understanding of God has changed and we have created him in our image. No wonder the words of Scripture seem to have such little power in our society. For we have found effective ways to make them subservient to the whims of psychology. The pleasures of life have eclipsed the giver of life, and we have cast his words behind us. So let us resolve by his grace and power to walk in his ways and to sanctify his name through righteous biblical relationships. Let us resolve once again to make our marriages a living testimony of God's love for his own, of Yeshua's relationship with his bride. Let us covenant once again before Hashem, before the Lord, to love life as he loves it, to guard and protect it as a supreme gift from his hand, and not to waste it or devalue it, but to agree with him that life is sacred. Let us in our relationships be the canvas upon which he may paint the glory of his own person and the majesty of his salvation. So, when people tell me the so-called Old Testament is irrelevant, I can only say one thing. They haven't read it. Pardon me? It's not in the New Testament. I don't know anywhere in the New Testament where it talks about abortion like our text does. Here's a woman that's pregnant. She is hit by negligent men fighting. Her baby comes forth. If it dies, then it's life for life, which means what? They're considering that negligent homicide, murder. 
I can't find anything in the in, in the apostolic scriptures that speaks specifically to that issue. No, because the, everybody that wrote the apostolic scriptures expects that everyone has already read the Tanakh. <laughs> They're living by it, you know. I still remember a time when I was, I don't remember where I was giving a, uh, speaking at a conference, and I went back to get my coat in the coat, they had a nice little coat closet in the auditorium there, and I went back there and, the, and uh, a lady said, I don't understand why you're, uh, you know, no, what did she say? Oh, she wanted to know why I was reading out of the New American Standard Bible rather than the King James Version, and I said, well, King James Version is a really great translation, but I think the, N uh, the NASB takes uh, advantage of the newer uh, translations. And she actually said this to me, and I thought she was joking, but I was careful not to smile because I realized she wasn't. She said, well, Paul had the King James Version and it was good enough for him. I mean, I've heard that as a joke, but I never heard any, I never heard anybody say that and really believe it. And I kind of looked at her and I said, no, no, no. Paul didn't have any of the New Testament. Oh. <laughs> Possibly, uh, no, I no, and but she she looked at me in, a, in just with a stare. She said, "What?" I said, "Paul didn't have any of the New Testament. It was in the process of being written. He was actually writing epistles that would eventually be part of the New Testament. But the Bible that he had is what you call the Old Testament. That's the only Bible he had." And she looked at me with this stare, like she's really. I said, "Yeah, yeah. Don't you, Paul's." was writing these letters that are in the Pauline epistles, you know, and the Gospels were in the process of being written by Luke and by Matthew and others. No, they, Paul didn't have those. They weren't bound together in a book. And uh, she just, she was aghast. And I thought, I mean, here's a woman that really loves the Lord and really cares, and she was willing to carefully come and confront me about something I'd said or actually what Bible I was reading. And I thought that was great. Really, I said, fantastic. But it just... You know, and this was, I don't know, 20 years ago? How long ago? I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, the demise of, of biblical illiteracy, or the, uh, not demise, the, the ramping up of biblical illiteracy and the demise, uh, or the demise of biblical literacy and the ramping up of illiteracy is just amazing to me. People don't, even people that go to church on a fairly regular basis don't know their Bible very well. Now, not across the board. There are some churches, maybe many, that are doing a really good job. But there are many that are not doing it at all. So, okay.